Good morning. There is light coming. There it is. Uh, hey, uh, spoiler alert. I didn't have hair ever. All right. it's, it's been gone a long, long time. Um, glad you're here. And I do hope you'll be able to stick around for lunch on the lawn. That's going to be fun. Um, what I, what I want to do is just spend a little bit of time before we jump into the message this morning. And I want us to pray. And I would like for you to pray a very specific prayer. Um, I, over the last several weeks when I've not been preaching, I thought, oh man, sometimes it's easy for us to just come in and listen and uh, kind of process, but here's what I want you to pray. I want you to just pray very specifically, God, would you speak to me right now in the next 30 minutes? Would you speak to me through your words? Uh, let's pray. Lord, we want to hear from you. Um, we want your word to ring true. We want it to draw us to you. And so God, our prayer right now is that you would speak to us, that you'd speak to us individually, you'd speak to us collectively. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, Colossians 3 is where we are. So if you've got your Bibles, take them out, open up the North Point app, uh, feel free to, to send in questions about this. Colossians 3 is uh, probably one of my favorite chapters in all of scripture because I think it speaks to us in just such plain terms about who we need to be and who we need to not be as well. Um, over the last several weeks when we started this series from Colossians, Colossians 1 and 2 really are kind of more theological in nature. They really set the stage for us in talking about, about how important Jesus is. Um, the language that's there is the preeminence of Christ, that he's above everything, that it all rises and falls with Jesus. Paul lays the foundation in the first half of his letter in that way and focusing really on Jesus and who he is. And then in chapter three, there's a word, you'll see it when we, when we dive in in just a second, that kind of turns the corner and says, okay, if that's true, if Jesus is really everything, what does that mean for us? What's that look like in real life? Um, how's it gonna impact the way that I live? Um, before we begin to read the first 11 verses, which is what we're going to look at today in chapter 3, let me say, set the stage with um, a scene from what I think is one of the greatest movies of all time. I shared that before the service with the band, and one member of the band said, that's not a good movie, it's a terrible movie. It crushed my spirit. I just want you to know that, okay? Um, here's, the, here's the scene. The farm boy, Wesley who has become the dread pirate Roberts, uh, uh, is, has, has been tortured by, by uh, Prince Humperdinck. Buttercup, the, the fair maiden Buttercup, is in love with Wesley. Prince Humperdinck wants to marry Buttercup, and so he has, uh, he has Wesley, farm boy Wesley, tortured to the point of death. Um, Buttercup's holding out hope that maybe Wesley might still be alive. Uh, Indigo Montoya and his giant Fezzik bring the body of Wesley to a character named Miracle Max and asks him for a miracle. Uh, Indigo says, I need him to help me avenge my father, murdered these 20 years. Miracle Max doesn't believe him and says, he probably owes you money. Well, I'll ask him. And Indigo says, uh, uh, he's dead. He can't talk. Miracle Max says, woo hoo hoo, look who knows so much, eh? It's just so happened that your friend is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Now, mostly dead is still slightly alive, right? Will anyone give me an amen about that movie? Okay, thank you, thank you. Listen to that, bandies, all right. Um, <laughs> In the book, in the book that was written by William Goldman, uh, this is the line that's there. I, I love this line. Uh, Miracle Max says, you see, there's different kinds of dead. There's sort of dead, mostly dead, and all dead. Today's message is titled, Some Things Have to Die. And the things that the writer, a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus named Paul, uh, uh, names need to be not sort of dead, not mostly dead, but all dead if we're serious about following Jesus. So let's dive in. We're gonna, we're gonna start with uh, Colossians chapter three, verse one. 
Since then, Paul says, since then, you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. If, uh, depending, if you're not using the North Point app, uh, you may be using a different version and, and the since then is translated therefore. Uh, we talked about it before, whenever you see therefore, you ask, have to ask what's it there for. Since then is that, it's that turn that says, okay, because of everything that we've said about Jesus, because that's true, this is what this is gonna look like. Because that's true, because you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Um, If you've been raised with Christ, recognize that your life is different if you're a follower of Jesus than if you're not. If you've never given Jesus control of your life, your life looks different, and this probably doesn't apply in the same way. But if you have been raised with Christ, everything's different. Um, it, w- it was fun for me a couple of weeks ago when I was, when I was listening to the message, listening as Mark preached from, from uh, chapter two of Colossians. Um, there was a phrase in there that made me think, oh man, that sounds just like Romans six when Paul is talking about baptism. We've talked about baptism before and that in baptism, a person who gives their life to Jesus, the old person dies and a new person is raised to life. Look at what, look at, uh, listen to what, uh, what Paul says in, in verse 20 of chapter two of Colossians. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why is if you're still living in the world, do you submit to the rules and regulations that says don't touch this, don't eat that, that kind of thing. If you have died to Christ, and here in chapter three he says, if you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. That's that same imagery that comes from Romans chapter six about baptism. Romans six says this, we were therefore buried with Christ through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. That imagery of baptism is so important for us to understand. The old person dies, not sort of dead, not mostly dead, but all dead. The old person dies and a new person um, is raised with Christ. Paul says, if that's true, if you've experienced that, set your sights on the realities of heaven is what the New Living Translation says. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God. Where is your focus gonna be? Verse two says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. If we've died with Christ, if we have become a new creature, with Christ, set your hearts and your minds on things above, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. We need to live in this world, we need to deal with the stuff of the world, but our hearts, our focus, our, the thing that consumes us is on Jesus, seated at the right hand of God. Um, Paul says to be so aware of what God is doing in your life, be so aware of what God is doing in your, in your life and in the world, in every place around you, that that's where your mind goes, that you're seeing God's footprint, God's thumbprint on everything. That's where your affection is. That's that constant awareness of where our mind goes. Please understand, recognize that that's a choice that we make every day, every moment of the day. We choose the focus of our hearts and minds. We determine where our mind's gonna go. It's easy to feel like, oh, you know what? I don't have any control over that. Satan just jumps in and makes me think about things that I don't wanna think about. But we choose where our minds go and where it lives. We control what we think about, whether it's good stuff, bad stuff. We decide if we'll worry about things that we can't control or whether we'll have a heart of gratitude for all the goodness that God has done in our lives. We choose who we love. Um, That concept is at the core of this passage because when we get down and look at the things that, that Paul says has to die, we make the choice for whether we allow them to be all dead or mostly dead and, and to come back and bite us. Um, uh, verse three, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I I like the way the new living translation translates this. It, It says, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. The real life, the real person that you are, we find that in your relationship with Jesus. 
Verse four, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Paul says Christ is everything. He's the, he's the glue, he's the thing that makes sense of all of your life. When, uh, when I was in college, I didn't plan, I went to a Christian college, but I didn't plan on doing vocational ministry. Um, I, I went all four years, got a degree, had, uh, have a degree in Bible, a degree in music, um, but I didn't plan on doing ministry. I thought that I'd um, just work in the workforce and that I'd be a leader in the church. So uh, my, my, uh, the, the year that we graduated, I took a part-time role at, um, in music ministry at a church that was about 45 minutes from where we lived. Deb and I got married and I was selling wood-burning stoves at the height of the energy crisis in 1981. It, they, they were good times, uh, you know? Um, and as, I, as, I, um, as we tried to balance doing ministry part-time just kind of as, uh, as an add-on, um, and working in the world, I, I learned something. One of the things that I learned was that ministry is life and life is ministry. That's a phrase I use a lot. Ministry is life and life is ministry. What's that mean? It means that when you, when God calls you into a place of ministry, it's not something that you can turn off um, you know, when you walk out the door. It's not the kind of thing that when, when I leave and drive home, all of a sudden everything about North Point, about the people who make up the body of Christ here, um, just gets turned off. Uh, um, there's a concern, uh, there's an awareness, there's, uh, um, you're always sensitive to what's going on in the lives of people because ministry is life and life is ministry. Um, what, what is it for you that you would say, oh, that's my life? I, um, I think my wife has a shirt someplace that says quilting is life. Um, sewing is life, that kind of thing. Football is life. What, what is, Deb doesn't have the shirt that says football is life, just so you know that. Um, what is it that you would say, oh, that's, that's my life. Everything kind of surrounds that aspect of my life. Paul says, when Christ, who is your life, uh, appears, that Christ is your life. Christ is life, life is Christ. He says to the church in Philippi, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What he's saying is your walk with Jesus is something that, that no matter what happens, that's at the center of who you are. When you're in crisis, um, there's Jesus. When great things are happening, there's Jesus. It's not something that you step into when you leave your car and walk in the parking lot of church on Sunday. It's not something that you turn on when you go and connect with your life group. It's not something that, that you, all of a sudden everything shifts when you're talking to somebody from church or somebody else who's a believer. Christ is life and life is Christ if you're a follower of Jesus. It's all connected. Um, Jesus is coming back, Paul says. There is hope in this broken, crazy world because, because Jesus is gonna return. Paul says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, when he comes back, then you also will appear with him in glory. There is this sense in, um, in verse four that, that N.T. Wright describes as both um, already and not yet. When we're in relationship with Jesus, it impacts the way that we live right now, here and today. It changes everything about what happens right here. It, it, Christ is our life already. He has done his work, he's forgiven us, he's changed the way that we think. But there's also a not yet part that says, our relationship with Jesus is not yet what it's gonna be in eternity. It's already changed us, but we're not changed fully. There's a not yet aspect to that. It's kind of like I, I was thinking about when Deb and I were engaged, we began to do a lot of things, not everything, we began to do a lot of things that were like when we, when, we, when, when we would be married. We went shopping for dishes, that was great fun. Um, but we, we, we rented an apartment, we moved stuff into the apartment, um, we didn't live together, that was, that was something that was gonna wait, but we began to act as though we were married. We, already, we had made the commitment but not yet. Maybe, maybe a better description of the already not yet thing that's, that's more appropriate in, uh, in, right now is in the world of football. If you're uh, in, 
at Michigan State, at UM, and at The Ohio State University. There are football players that have come onto campus that have enrolled that are, that they're in their freshman year. They're already a part of the football team. They're, they've participated in summer practice. They learn in their plays, but they've not yet been on the field this fall. They're already a part of the team, but not yet a part of the team. Does that make sense? Someone shake your head and say, yeah, Rick, we're there. Yeah, yeah Rick, we're there. Okay, good. Um, um, Paul, Paul says, you're already connected with Christ, but not in the way that it's gonna be eventually. And because of that, some things have to die. Some things have to die. Um, N.T. Wright says, by bluntly naming sins which are all too often excused or glossed over with euphemisms, Paul sets a clear standard for the church, both ancient and modern. And now if you look in advance at where we're gonna go in the next several verses, there are two separate lists, one in verse five, one in verse eight. The, ver the, the list in verse five focuses on um, inappropriate sexual behavior the impact of, of sexual stuff in our world today. And the second list that's down in verse eight focuses really on the relationships that we have with other people. Um, it's easy to focus on one list or the other. If you just focus on the sexual thing and, and stay pure sexually, but have broken relationships in every aspect of your life because, because you have this perspective of just protecting that area of your life, that's no good. And if you focus on relationships so much that you don't pay any attention to what God has called us to in terms of sexual purity, that's no good either. Both lists are there, and Paul's gonna say both set sets of things need to die. They need to be dead. Verse five, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Um, the New Living Translation says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Again, we have a choice to make, whether to be proactive or reactive as we look at these issues in our life. And then he begins to list. Uh, the very first thing he says to put to death is sexual immorality. The word, the Greek word that's there is the word pornea. It's the word that we get the word pornography from. Um, in scripture, that word is used to describe sexual intercourse with anyone who is not your spouse, not your husband or wife. Um, that includes somebody that you're not married to yet. It includes homosexual relationships, lesbian relationships, incest, incestuous relationships, bestiality. That's the way that scripture uses that word pornea. And Paul says, put that to death. Let that die. The second thing that he says there is impurity. Contamination, impurity, the, what's, what's involved in that word in the original language is the contamination, that, uh, the contamination of our character that comes as a result of sexual sin. You know, there's, there's two things happen when, when you're involved in sexual sin. One, one is the act itself of disobedience, that, that there's this broken relationship that you have with God. But there's, there's something else that happens when you, when you live in that world, and that's that you live with this sense of burden and sense of separation, and, and a great word is contamination. It's like this peace has impacted the way I see all of life. I, I, it, it impacts my joy, it impacts my outlook on life, it impacts my other relationships. And that's what Paul is talking about when he uses the word impurities. What do we need to put to death? Sexual immorality and impurity. Next thing that he lists there is lust. Um, the Amplified says that's, uh, describes that as sinful passions. It's, um, it's probably the best Greek definition is uncontrolled sexual urges, lust. The fourth thing that he says there is evil desires. It, evil desires, it is, um, it's craving for what God forbids, for what God says, no, don't go there. It's this, uh, this, this thing that I've gotta have some of that. That's the evil desires. Recognize that sexual temptation is not sin, but living in that temptation, cultivating that temptation, that's where that kind of turns the corner and becomes an evil desire. It's when we think, oh man, I want that. 
And, and we begin to generate the images in our mind, the thoughts in our minds that takes us to a different place. Feeding that. The last thing that he lists in that first list is greed, which is idolatry, which is kind of interesting because there's all, all of this stuff about sexual sin and then it says greed. And we tend to think in the context of greed that that's all about money, about having more. But in this context and in what Paul is talking about to the church in Colossae, um, he, he's talking about wanting something uh, and an unchecked hunger for physical pleasure that... that um, or anything else that only should come from God. It's this unchecked hunger, that's what's there. Um, the ESV translates that covetousness. Um, it's this sense that unless I have these things, I won't be happy. That's, that's, that's that sense of greed, which is idolatry. That we're so focused on what we want that that takes the place of God. Um, Fun list, huh? And yet, God calls us to put those things to death. How, how, how do you wrestle with those things in your life? How, how do you put those things to death? Because we live in a very sexual culture. How do you put those things to death? I was thinking about that and I thought, I think, I think the best advice that I can give um, is to use war imagery and to say simply, cut off the supply lines. If you think about the war that's occurring right now between Russia and Ukraine, um, there is a lot, there has been a lot of um, head to head combat between Russia and Ukraine. But Ukraine has survived the war for one reason they have cut off the supply lines to the Russian troops. So Russia has moved their troops into Ukraine and the Ukrainian army has attacked the supply lines that feed the Russian army with ammunition, with food, with um, supply, medical supplies, with transport, with tanks, with, um, with all of their military wares, knowing that if they could cut off the supply lines, those troops that were engaged in battle would be neutralized. They would be neutered. They wouldn't have the ability to fight. When we talk about putting to death those aspects in our lives, that sexual sin, what do we need to do? We need to cut off the supply lines. We need to stop the food chains. Um, when we do that, it loses its strength. There's, a, there's an old story that's told about a Cherokee grandfather that was talking about talking with his son or his grandson, he was talking with his grandson, telling him that, that inside everyone there are two wolves that are vying for, for control in, in every person's lives. Um, there's a, a good wolf uh, that stands for all the good things, that wants to do all the good things, and this wolf that, that is consumed with evil, with destruction. Um, and the grandson t said to his grandfather, uh, grandfather, which wolf will win the battle between those two wolves? And the grandfather said, Whichever one you feed, whichever one you feed, when we feed our mind with the things of Christ, when we set our hearts on things above, when we set our minds on things above, and we feed the Holy Spirit within us, the Holy Spirit takes greater and greater control as we give it to him. But if we feed that sexual nature, if we feed that part that's in opposition to God, that just continues to grow and have continued strength, cut Cut the supply lines. Uh, Paul says this in verse six. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Um, the, 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 don't miss this. The wrath of God is not um, a malicious or capricious anger. It's not God just sitting up there wanting to thump us, you know, wanting to smack us down. It's not that at all. It's that God is so concerned about us that his wrath is gonna get rid of sin in our lives. He's gonna get rid of sin in the world because of his holiness, because of his justice, because of his goodness. Um, he doesn't want there to be wickedness and exploitation and evil in the world that he's created. Like, like that already and not yet that we talked about in, in terms of uh, with Jesus, um, God's wrath is also already and not yet. God's, we, we see it in our world around us that God's wrath, God's punishment happens when we're consumed by sexual sin. 
It, it, it eats at our souls. It destroys relationships that we have with other people. Um, the, God's natural law takes, takes place. It, it, it um, impacts our physical bodies. And so God's wrath is displayed already because of our sexual sin. And yet, not yet in the way that it will be when ultimately we stand before God, when God judges the world. Um, again, Paul says, some things have to die. Not sort of dead, not mostly dead, but all dead. Some things have to die. We've gotta put those, that, that sexual temptation, that list that's there to death. It really is this sense of kill or be killed. Um, there's, there is that spiritual war that's going on within us that if we allow it to be sort of dead, mostly dead, it's gonna come back and, and just attack us with a vengeance. We've gotta put it to death. Verse seven, Paul says, you used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived. The, the New Living Translation says, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. The, the literal translation of the Greek of that phrase, uh, this is how you walked when your life consisted of such wretched things as these. Don't miss this. The Roman culture was incredibly carnal. I don't know if you, if you like to read history or not. Uh, I guess as I get old, there's more history to read, right? Um, and I, I like it more. But when you read uh, um, in, in archaeology right now, all of the things that they've discovered in the ruins of Mount Vesuvius, when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD and wiped out that part of the world, they found just this incredibly carnal um, culture that existed there. Brothels, every place. People involved in all kinds of sexual sin at that point. That was the world in the first century. And Paul says to the church, some of you live like that. That's, that was your story. God has saved you from that. God has changed you from that. And that's the story, that's the hope that we have as followers of Jesus. To be able to say, some of you live like that. Some of you lived like that. You know that past, but no more. Here's, here's a tremendous word of hope in this message, okay? Hear this. Our past does not have to be our destiny. Our past does not have to be our destiny. So if you've struggled with sexual sin, if you've, if you've got a history in that area that, that you just wish that you could take out of your mind and get rid of, understand that our past does not have to be our destiny. Jesus came to change us, to give us a new hope, a new future. Paul says, that's the life that some of you lived, but no more. Verse eight, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. He said, again, he says, put to death. This is the stuff that has to die. Some things have to die. Anger, anger, hmm. You go from all that sexual stuff to anger, ouch, right? Um, the, the, the meaning of that word in the Greek is the continuing state of smoldering and seething hatred. The, it's, this, it's this persistent angry, a anger, right? Um, What's the famous line from Dr. Bruce Banner, the renowned scientist and highly respected physicist for his work in biochemistry? You don't wanna see me angry, right? I, that's not it. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry, is what the Hulk says, right? Paul says, you gotta get rid of anger. That, that brings up the question, wait, didn't Jesus get angry? Didn't we just talk about that several months ago? Yeah, but Jesus, I don't think, got angry about the things that we get angry about, the things that make us angry. Jesus got angry about injustice and the creation of burdens that were placed on people that kept them from experiencing the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness and love of God. Why, why do we get angry? Take some time and just think about that for a second. For the most part, I think, we get angry because we're inconvenienced. 
we get angry because someone takes away control of something that we think that we should have control of. We get angry because we don't get our own way, like a petulant child. We get angry when someone wrongs and disrespects us. We get angry when someone makes us feel bad, whether that's legitimate or not. We get angry when someone holds us accountable for our actions. Paul says, you got to get rid of it. You got to get rid of that anger. Then he, then he moves on to rage, which is really this uncontrolled anger. It's like anger on steroids. It's anger that's put into actions, anger that's put into words that are meant to, to hurt and destroy. There is this sense in this series, as, as I was studying through, where it's like the first word is stated and the second word fleshes that out um, with, with a level of multiplication and amplification, anger and rage. The next word there is malice. It's evil intended to cause hurt, malice. It's, it's the sense of pure hatred with evil intent. And then slander is the word that is, is really kind of like malice put into words. The Greek word for slander that's there is an interesting word. It's the word blasphemia, blasphemia. We tend to only think about that in terms of blaspheming God, speech that dishonors God. Um, and yet slander is speech that dishonors God by destroying the life or the reputation of one of his creation, of somebody in the world that we live in. When we slander them, we're, we're, we're taking away the value that they have, that God has given them in, in creating them. Um, I, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, does, does slander have to be a false accusation? Because that's what we tend to think about. Oh, you're going to slander somebody. You're going to say things about them that aren't true. I, I don't necessarily think that that's the case. Um, slander can just be a bad report about someone that doesn't really need to be shared. We can slander their reputation, their character, their heart. He goes on and says, filthy language from your lips. The um, English Standard Version says, obscene talk with your mouth. What, what Paul is describing the, there is words that contaminate both the speaker and the hearer. Words that contaminate both the speaker and the hearer. Um, I've got, a, I've got a big section of notes about this because I've been th thinking about this um, a lot, this, this concept of filthy language. Um, as followers of Jesus, I think that God calls us to speech and speech patterns that build each other's, that build others up and that speak the truth in love and with grace. And it's easy for us because of the culture that we live in to begin to assimilate the culture into our language and to begin to say things and to use words, descriptive words, because everybody else does, and, and for that to just come freely. And so it becomes really easy for us to say um, words that become adjectives or descriptors that don't really have any purpose at all. You know, F this, S that. What, all those kinds of things. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? When Paul says get rid of filthy language, it contaminates us and it contaminates hearers. I was out someplace, um, and, and you know, I, even though I'm a pastor, I want you to know that my ears hear things um, where I go. I'm, I'm not surprised by words. But I was outside a restaurant, and, and um, there were a couple of people talking, and, and they were effing this, effing that, F and this, F and that, F and this, F and that. And I thought, man, I am so glad that my kids and my grandkids are not here. Because I don't want them to hear those words. Um, as followers of Jesus, we don't need to do that. We, we don't need to give into that language. Oftentimes we think, I, I, I need to to make a point. You don't, you don't. If you wanna make a point with your language, get softer. Use less words. Don't just fill it with language that you think will, will um, give it greater impact. Um, here are my notes. 
If you can't communicate your anger or displeasure or opposition to an idea without using gutter language, you're not a very good communicator. It's much better to reduce volume and choose the exact words that communicate what you want rather than to say words that make you look like a 14-year-old boy trying to impress his 14-year-old friends. Someone please say amen. (laughs) Filthy language from your lips. God says, it needs to be put to death. Not sort of dead, not mostly dead, but all dead. Our language has the ability to communicate to the world around us that we are different from them. That God has done a work in us. Words matter. They often can change a situation, a relationship irrevocably. Verse nine, Paul says, don't lie to each other. Um, You know, the truth is often inconvenient. It's often untidy. It's often embarrassing. And yet as disciples of Jesus, we're called to speak the truth in love, to be truthful and yet gracious. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount something that, man, we just don't embrace very often. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't need to swear. You don't need to say, oh man, I really mean this. You don't need to pinky swear. Just let your language stand for itself. Let your honesty be seen in your speech. Um, I, I, I said this to my kids. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times they could probably tell you. To tell a half truth as the whole truth is no truth at all. Parents, write that down. All right? To tell employees, write that down. Bosses, write that down. Followers of Jesus, write that. To tell a half truth as the full truth is no truth at all. Mark Twain said, a half truth is the most cowardly of lies. Um, Benjamin Franklin said, half the truth is often a great lie. We tend, again, we tend to defend our need to lie rather than telling the truth with grace and wisdom. When your wife says, does this make me look fat? She's not really asking if she looks fat. She's really asking, do you love me no matter what I look like? And and, am I gonna embarrass myself? Am I gonna embarrass other people? The, The right answer to that question is not no or yes. The right question is to speak to your wife's heart, right? Oftentimes, we, we need to speak the truth in love with grace and stop lying. Um, it's so easy for us, it's so easy for us to not tell the truth about little stuff that doesn't matter. You know, you, 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 you go on a diet and somebody says, oh, how you doing? Ah, I'm making good progress. How much have you lost? And, and you looked at the scales in the morning and, that you, and you know that you've lost 12 and a half pounds. And you say, oh, I've lost about 15 pounds. Does two and a half pounds make a difference at that point in time? Not, not at all, right? Except that it whittles away at our ability to be honest with ourselves. Speak the truth. Paul says, Paul says um, to not lie to each other. Um, and he says, don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. This is the end of nine and verse 10. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in, the, in knowledge in the image of its creator. Paul says, don't do those things that I've just mentioned in verses eight and nine because you've put off, the old person has died and you are a new person. He introduces imagery that we're gonna talk about next week in the next several verses. Uh, uh, it's imagery of clothing, that you take things off and put things on. You take off the things that, that get killed and you put on other things instead. Um, being renewed, being renewed through Christ is another one of those already and not yet things. Christ renews us today but he's gonna renew us even more in the future. Um, He's doing the work in us now, but it's not not the work that's gonna be completed at a later date. When we give our lives to Jesus, our sins are forgiven, all that stuff in the past goes away. The slate's wiped clean, and our nature changes. Who we are changes from sinner to saint. The old is gone, the new has come. 
We've taken off the old self with all of its old practices, and we've put on that new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the, uh, in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Don't miss this again. We have a choice. We have a choice about what we want to feed, what we want to cut the supply lines to. We have a choice of what is going to be put to death and what's not. Verse 11, here there is no uh, Gentile or, or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is, and is in all. Um, I, I gotta finish really quickly in the next couple minutes, but let me just say this. In the body of Christ, there is no room for prejudice. There is no room for prejudice in the body of Christ. The Jew-Gentile conflict that Paul talks about this, if, if you wanna make it really real to you, that's the conflict that would exist between the KKK and African Americans. It's that, that level of intensity when they read this, that's what's described. When he says circumcised or uncircumcised, for Jews, it was a big, big deal to say, I'm circumcised, I'm a, I have been chosen by God, I'm a part of God's chosen people, and everybody else doesn't matter at all. There was lots of tension and conflict in that. Barbarian and Scythian, barbarians were anybody who, that they, at this point in time, they would say barbarian is anybody who doesn't speak the Greek language. Oh, those dumb people, that they don't look like us, they don't talk like us, they don't live like that. And Scythians were like even beyond that. That Scythians, they would have described as like third world stupid people. Paul says, there is no difference between any of them. We're all one in the body of Christ. And then the last thing he says is slave or free. People who are owned by other people or people who are free. There is no room for any of that in the body of Christ. Um, let me just say this uh, and, and, and just give you this. I, I've just finished a book that um, Mark had recommended to me, uh, a book called Talking About Race. And um, if you want to read a book that will challenge you to your core in terms of your being a follower of Jesus and figuring out how to have conversations about race in a, in a healthy way that honors Christ, read this book. It's hard to read because it, um, because it really attacks the problems that we have as whites, as blacks, as Asians, as Hispanics in working out this issue of race within the body of Christ. It's a really good book. Um, I don't get anything for that. That's just a plug out of my life, all right? Um, let, me, let me just finish with this. Jesus, Jesus came to give hope. Jesus came to give hope. He didn't come to, to create this burdensome list, this, this uh, heavy burden that we would have to, to, to bear to follow him. He came to give us life and to give us freedom. And that's the reason why he says some things have to die. And dead means dead. Put to death those things that destroy your soul, that, that separate you from God so that you can have a relationship with him that gives you hope and joy and life through Jesus. Um, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word, for the power of your word. And God, I, I thank you that... Um, that when we look in the mirror, we hear your spirit clearly speak to us. God, draw us to you. Help us to not play with sin, but to be drawn to you as followers of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.